Good morning. Um, just so, just as we're getting started here, uh, um, so Pete wants to come up and share something with us before we get going. So Pete, come on up. Looks like, looks like a few more of you trickled in here. That's good. <laughs> All right, as you know, uh, we've been going through a, a bit of a trial in our family, and uh, Lorraine was just saying, oh, what a terrible trial. I said, no, trials are good. They're good because they exercise our faith. We don't like them when we're going through them, but uh, they're good for us. Yesterday in men's uh, study, we were in uh, Genesis, the 15th chapter, and it says the word of the Lord appeared to Abram. That's Jesus, by the way. And it said to him, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And we need to remember that continually. So we've been going through a trial. Our uh, eighth grandchild was born a couple days ago, little girl, and she weighed eight pounds and something. I didn't keep the exact statistics. But at the very last second as they went in, uh, it was a terrible medical emergency. And my daughter-in-law's uterus ruptured and they had to immediately rush them in to save both mother and child. And the baby has had uh, breathing problems, oxygen problems, and uh, it got uh, to the point where, as some of you know, they were thinking of rushing the baby by air flight to uh, Charleston, about 300 miles away, to do a um, pulmonary bypass, a heart-lung bypass, to oxygenate the blood. And during this time, there's been some ups and downs and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, emotions involved here. And uh, I have just had a kind of a, a feeling that the little girl's going to be okay. And uh, it's kind of confirmed to us uh, in that our friend uh, from Alaska, that her son is a doctor who specializes in pulmonary uh, uh, issues. And his thought was... You know, uh, the baby would be just fine. They do that stuff at Charleston all the time. He's back there, and he's familiar with the facility and everything else. And he says, it's really kind of routine. He says, I'm concerned for the mother because she could die from this. Very, very serious thing. And so it, uh, it, during this whole thing, my daughter-in-law has been feeling uh, like... Well, I should have done this differently. I should have just come in for a C-section instead of trying to have the child naturally. She's already had a, a couple of C-sections and a couple of natural births. And uh, so uh, she's kind of beating herself up emotionally over the whole situation with the little girl. When one of the nurses says, you know, it's kind of a remarkable thing. Whenever uh, there's going to be uh, a birth, uh, they have a surgical team in waiting. They prepare everything. And when my twin boys were born, they had two of everything waiting so that they were ready for any kind of an emergency that might come along. And the moment that she came through the door, not having made arrangements for a C-section and thinking, oh, I should have done that, it's the prevenient grace of God Almighty that he prepared beforehand that uh, she should be spared. Because there was a family in there about to have triplets. And so they had three of everything. And so the minute she came through the door, there was already the doctors were scrubbed in, the nurse was scrubbed in, the instruments were prepared, and they had an extra person that was prepared to immediately take care of the need that was there. We serve a wonderful God. It's a marvelous thing. And my daughter-in-law said afterwards that she was humbled, that God would prepare beforehand to take care of every deficiency. So a lot of times we get all upset, but, you know, God's watching out. He's watching out for us. God is good all the time, all the time. <clears throat> We were, we were swapping stories a little bit after prayer this morning, and Gwen uh, remembered a time when they're driving down the road, and suddenly their car stalls, so they have to pull over to the curb like, what's going on with this? And then a truck carrying lumber 
passes them up and has to stop at the red, red light there and loses its whole lumber over the top of it where they would have been sitting. Isn't that something? God's previous. And you know what? We're not going to have to go through trials that he doesn't have planned for us. See, that's the key. You know, it doesn't mean that we don't go through trials, but that we have a confidence that when we do, we can trust the Lord in them. And so, uh, so this morning, um, I do want to mention real quick, uh, the baptism was really cool on Wednesday night. And uh, we really enjoyed celebrating with the three that were baptized. And it was, um, it was just, uh, it was joyous. And then I wasn't able to get the baptismal downstairs, so I had to put it in the foyer. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I spoke before I measured, you know. Uh, it wouldn't fit downstairs. So we rolled it through and put it over kind of off the side in the foyer. And it was... Um, uh, it was fun because when we finally did the baptism, everybody was standing up along the railing and down the stairs and down the ones going downstairs and along the back and along the side. And so when, when I looked out, all I seen was faces at different levels. And it would have made a really cool picture, but nobody was there to take it. And I was bummed out because if they were standing behind, uh, behind us and took that picture, it was just so cool looking. And then, uh, and now... We have two more uh, requests for baptisms, and so we're already looking at summertime. But what I'd really like to, to do, and we have some really fond memories, is baptism at Tumalo Creek, and where we just have a barbecue, and it's warm enough, and the water's cold enough. <laughs> yeah, I did everything I could to get the water warmer on Wednesday night. We emptied our hot water heater into the tank. We boiled water and poured it into the tank. But the amount of water that we still had to put into it from the hose made it freezing again. And it, it, when I say freezing, it was about 50 instead of 35 out of the faucet. And uh, compared to last year when we had one out here, it was warm, relatively speaking. But I made the comment, it's always good to baptize a plumber because the plumber already knows that he's going to give us a... I think he called it a, a tankless water heater so that we will have 90 degree water the next time we have a baptism indoors. So I thought that was, that was really good. <laughs> but anyway, so um, we're going to be in Leviticus <coughs> chapter 5. And, um, and let's go ahead and start with, with prayer. Lord, thank you for, again, your word and just for your promises to us, and we thank you uh, for being faithful. So we give you this time and just pray that you would speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, we're traveling through, as you well know, through the Bible, and uh, we're here in the book of Leviticus, and on Wednesdays in Proverbs and Psalms, and, uh, you know, we... Um, um, need to <laughs> study the Old Testament. We talked about that. I want each time that we enter another chapter of Leviticus, uh, I want to mention that um, that why we study the Old Testament book, and simply because it is God's word. And uh, it would be a big mistake. It's necessary because it is God's word. It'd be a big mistake to just skip it. And so we study. The word, And because of it, we're able then to stand in our faith in the battle, because it is a battle. If you haven't noticed yet, life is a battle. And when you recognize that there's a spiritual realm, you recognize where the battle really is. And uh, it was the Apostle Peter, and, um, and he explains it well when he says in 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. And so he speaks of 
being able to give an answer because you're ready and to have a good conscience in the process. In other words, you being able to clear the air about people that have questions, and a lot of those questions come in the minds of the people because of the Old Testament, and because the church isn't necessarily prepared to give an answer, they back off or make excuses because they're not sure themselves. Well, we need to be sure. And that's why, you know, we need to have our feet underneath us regarding the whole counsel of God. It was the Apostle Paul that said that we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's also a reference to the Old Testament. And, um, and you know, and as a pastor, of course, I have specific instruction uh, regarding regarding the word and and that regarding uh, my ministry where in the new in the church it said in Ephesians 4 and he he himself gave some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And listen, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love. And so I'm called as a pastor to that accountability. And so we must learn the word. Fortunately, as a new believer, my pastor believe the same way and I had a great foundation of the Old Testament and a lot of the dots of the Old Testament were connected to the New Testament and it made sense but to take that all away leaves a lot of questions to be answered that usually the enemy in the battle sets you up and it's a sad scenario you know I was fortunate enough at you know a young age at 12 years old to have a dad that was old school and a painter and decided that he was gonna teach his sons a trade, free labor, that's good, right? So we'd go to work with my dad on weekends and in summers while my friends were out on the beach doing whatever. And old school was is that if we didn't do it right, he made us do it again. And we started from the bottom when sanding and putting and caulking and spackling, doing it all. And I remember one time I was gonna impress my dad and I was gonna do two whole houses of puttying and uh, which is, you know, you, you, the consistency of the putty has to be right. The knife has to have the flex. Everything has to be right so that when you put that putty in the hole and you cut it off, it's perfect so that when you paint it, you don't see it. But if you don't do it right, it cups, it cracks, all kinds of weird things happen if everything isn't right. So I did two houses. And my dad came towards the end of the day and looked. And he says, tomorrow you will do these two houses again because it's not right. And... I grew up that way and learned that way and was fortunate because that's like the old apprenticeship program when people learning a trade would actually live with the journeyman and learn it the right way. And today now people are thrust into the trades without really knowing how to do much of what they do. Well, I'm going to hire you as a spray man. And so I'm going to teach you how to spray. That's all you're going to do. And so you talk to some people, and 28 years I painted, and I would know. I say, okay, I'm going to hire you as a painter. Well, I don't brush. I just spray. Well, then don't tell me you're a painter because you're not a painter. A painter does everything. And if you can't do everything, don't call yourself a painter. And so we grew up, you know, uh, with that sort of mindset but I remember when I worked for a, paint, a plastering contractor and because I could kind of speak shop, they taught me the computer program that had to do with only estimating. I was the estimator. And my understanding in painting just worked right over to plastering. So I could go out to the job size, talk to the superintendents, talk shop, get the job, bid them, you know, get contracts and do it with this program. Now I knew nothing about computers. They said, this is the switch you turned it on. This is the button you, you hit to get into that program. And this is how that program works. So I would go in there, 
and it was the coolest estimating thing you'd ever seen. You'd punch in eighth inch, quarter inch, whatever it was, you'd have this little pen, and you'd poke here, poke there, poke here, press a button, and it would calculate everything. And it was like I could get all the measurements in just such a small amount of time, and I'd put together the estimations, and I'd send it off and get jobs. But what do I know about computers? I knew nothing, but it was a pretty cool program. And I say all that because there's too often the Christians learn something in the New Testament that's really cool, really excited about it, but when push comes to shove, they can't stand up for their faith. They know nothing of what the Bible teaches. In my Bible, the Old Testament's like 845 pages, and the New Testament's 250 or something. I would say that that Old Testament is a big chunk of God's Word. And that's why we need to know what it says. And it's so much, it becomes part of our heart and part of our faith to the point that even last Sunday, there was a couple visiting here and I got talking to them to find out that their son who was raised in a church um, went off to college and now he's a confessed atheist. And he told his parents only to the breaking of their heart that he would say such a thing. And that's what happens so often to not only young people, but young people become old people and still don't have that solid foundation of the Word of God. It's sort of like the mindset of the, the young people in the country who really just sort of don't, you know, they're not, they're, they're taught selective history. They're not taught the truth, the whole truth about history. And so when it comes to our freedom, they're so e we're ready to give it up. They're so ready to give up our freedom because they're not taught that the very freedom we have was bought by the blood and sacrifice of many. So they're not taught that, so they're so willing to give up and take for granted the freedom. But what they don't know is once you give it up, nobody's going to give it back to you. It's going to have to be sought for exactly the same way and so when the church doesn't understand the sacrifice, then they're too often willing to just take grace for granted or to give up their freedom. But the thing is, is once you give up your freedom, how do you get it back? Fortunately, God has given us our freedom because of Jesus Christ. But this foundation in our hearts is so important. And I have always said that if my kids backslide any five of them, or any of them walk away from the Lord, they're going to do it with their eyes wide open. They're going to know exactly what they're doing, and they're going to understand the Word of God. Not part of it, not this little part of it, but the whole of God's Word. So then they can connect the dots, and when they get attacked on for this ancient book that you believe, or whatever, they're going to say, wait a minute. There's a lot of things that connect to what we're doing today, and they're going to understand it and see that's huge. And so as a parent, as a dad, as responsible, but as a pastor, I am too. This book of Leviticus, the third book of the Bible, is quoted 150 times in the New Testament. Do you know what that tells us? That tells us in order to really understand the New Testament, you have to understand what's written in the book of Leviticus. That's why it's quoted so much. And, you know, the old covenant helps us to understand and appreciate the new covenant, the New Testament, <clears throat> by understanding really why God gave his law in the first place. So by doing so, we don't take for granted the grace that is ours. And Paul writes in Galatians 3, 24 through 26, <clears throat> he says, um, therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And so the comments he made, made there is a relationship to what we know or don't know about the Old Testament. 
which is huge. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul, also writing to the church at Rome, Rome in chapter 6, and he says this in verse 14 and 15, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Why then shall we sin? Because we are, he said, what then? I'm sorry, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Or God forbid. And so there's that connection again. We're not under the law. <clears throat> and, and so we can look back to the requirement of the law and be reminded that no one is made righteous by the law. And the breaking of the law has consequences, and those consequences are sin and death. And so knowing that, having this knowledge would be that determining factor in a person's life. The people knew that if they forsook God, that that decision would ultimately have dire consequences. And, and so, you know, these are things that we understand as we study through the word of God. And, you know, this freedom that we're given, we're given in Christ. And I'll tell you what, it's very important, just as we would understand the freedom we have in this country, as I mentioned, uh, to have a proper view of history, we have to have a proper view of biblical history in order to understand the freedom we have in Christ. The connection is huge. And anyone who, you know, kind of dismisses the importance of it is making a big mistake because it's foundational in our walk. And so here in Leviticus chapter 5, uh, you know, if we were to just to uh, drop in and I start reading, you know, I pray and then I start reading verse 1, it would be like, if you weren't up to speed, you think, what in the heck do we even know that, have to know this for? Well, it all adds up. And uh, we do need to know it. And so <laughs> this here, uh, verse 1, if a person sins in hearing the utterance of an oath, and it is a witness, um, and is a witness whether he has seen or known of the matter, if he does not tell it, he bears guilt. First thing, this is number five in the list of five offerings that is taught here in Leviticus. This is the last of those. The first one we saw in chapter one was the burnt offering. Remember, the, the offering that continues to burn, that, it, that one is all in its free will offering. And in chapter two was the meal offering of no blood. That was the one that pointed to the living sacrifice that, you know, it, it may not be called for our blood to sacrifice, but we're to be living sacrifice all in and able to come in an acceptable sacrifice. And then we have in chapter three, the peace offering. And that was my favorite because it talks about the fellowship offering, like a big barbecue. You come. It doesn't mention the sin. It just mentions coming and offering and enjoying and sharing and that peace offering. So you have the burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace offering. Last chapter was the sin offering. And the emphasis there was that all have sinned. Kind of a, a if you will, a general uh, dealing with sin and, um, and, and even unintentional sin. And it talked about the priest first, talked about, uh, you know, the common person, <laughs> talked about the whole congregation, that all have sinned. Well, this chapter, chapter 5, being the, the trespass offering, is like the sin offering in many ways, but it becomes more specific where it begins to spell out the detail of some sin. So that's really the, the, the distinguishing factor, uh, much like the sin offering, but it adds to also those who would be aware of specific s sin, whereas a sin is just, you know, missing the mark, even unintentional or unaware. And so, uh, and so here you have um, somebody who, uh, who hears a, an oath uttered and is a witness 
whether he has seen or known of the matter. If he does not tell it, he bears guilt. And so the witness would be somebody who, like if you were witness an accident, you're not supposed to leave the scene of an accident. Why? Because you have information that might be very important to the one who would be the innocent party in that accident. So you're accountable, you're supposed to be accountable to wait and to give your testimony. But concealing of knowledge when it's wrong uh, <laughs> is uh, a sin. Uh, you would be guilty. And so there's an accountability to act. And um, when you become aware of something, then you're responsible with the information that you're given. Otherwise, in a sense, you would end up an accessory to the wrongdoing, um, the crime, let's say. And so it wasn't enough uh, just not to tell, for instance, a lie, but the requirement was also to speak the truth. And so sometimes people think, well, just as long as I change my lifestyle, because now I'm a Christian, everything is good. Well, changing your lifestyle is not only not doing something, but it's also doing something. There's a combination. Uh, it's, it's, like, it's like the idea of the sins of omission. Something's a sin because it's omitted from your life. And there's also the idea of something's a sin because you're committing it in your life. Both apply. And so that's why once we become in the more knowledge of what God would have for us, we're responsible to step up and do what is required with that knowledge. And so that's basically what's being said there. In verses 2 and 3, you have the subject of, of, of ceremonial purification. And that's going to be explained later. And I think it's chapter 11 when it's going to, we're going to deal with that. So it's speaking about unclean things that one is not supposed to touch. And so for them to approach the Lord, there had to be a purification or a, a preparation in order to approach the Lord. And so or if a person touches any unclean thing, whether it is the carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of unclean uh, livestock or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and he is unaware of it, he also shall be unclean and guilty. Or if he touches human uncleanness, whatever uncleanness with which a man may be defiled, and he is unaware of it, when he real realizes it, then he shall be guilty. And so, you know, here you have, once again, things that are going to be spelled out later. But just what I want to mention here is that practical aspect of what's being talked about here, because it's never good to touch dead animals because of the bacteria and disease that would be associated with it, which they would not even have a clue of what that meant. It's like even in the days of George Washington, the poor guy gets sick and the doctors say, well, we got to take blood out of you. And they keep taking blood out of the guy till he dies because that was modern medicine. There's things that people just don't know, like the association with, with, with the viruses and the flus and all that existed in times past. They had no idea what was being, where this stuff was even coming from. But God said, I'm going to give you some rules that you're going to follow. You're not going to understand them necessarily, but they're for a reason. When I was over in China and we were stuck someplace we weren't supposed to be off the tourist, you know, track. And when they brought that food out and things just didn't really look right about it, but I was starving and there was all that food out there and stuff I didn't even recognize. And when I ate it, it's textures I didn't recognize. Um, and most, me and another fellow, we kind of ate everything. <coughs> but uh, I know the ladies I always said were the smartest because they ate just the white rice. How could you go wrong with that? But I remember praying, Lord, 
If there's bacteria here, you know, because when you see when you see a rat running through the kitchen area before you're going to sit down and eat, that brings questions to mind. And so if there's bacteria here on this food, Lord, it's as big as elephants to you. You can see it. So I just pray that you bless this food and, nur you know, nourish it to our bodies. And then I went ahead and ate. And it was really crazy because when we lifted that one big tin that none of us knew was under, and there was a whole ch chicken spread out with its head and its tongue and everything sticking out there, you know, just like, wow, that was a surprise. But there's reasons why we pray, right? There's reasons why we follow the rule of the Lord. And I know that a couple months back, there was that, that young girl in Prineville that got bubonic plague. And so I talked to somebody who knows her, and in, they were someplace in eastern Oregon, and they saw a dead squirrel and wanted to see, hey, how the squirrel died. And so they went and kicked it and looked at it and did some things. And a flea jumped off of that dead squirrel and bit her. She got bubonic plague. So it's probably good not to touch a dead squirrel in the future. I'm going to kind of walk around them. Well, how far can a flea jump? That's how far around I'm going to walk around that thing. Because I know that now. And I, and I, did, I did happen to mention the time that I went to the dentist here just back a little ways. And she was the one in the seat before I was in the seat that the dentist. So I thought that was kind of interesting. God had a sense of humor, but she was there because she was okay. You know, but uh, I made for an interesting story from the pulpit. I always got to throw stuff like that in there once in a while. But, but the idea is, you know, today we have sanitizer bottles. And, you know, uh, if you've ever been near a reclama uh, reclamation plant uh, where they're dealing with all the dead horse bodies and what, what's that called? Render, rendering plant, yeah, sorry. And, uh, and if you've ever been by one of those, they smell rancid. But they're making food for animals. And so, you know, they're dealing with all of this death. It's outside the city. It's always outside the city. But they're dealing with it. We don't see it so much. But I remember, I can't remember where it was that I went into one of these places. And it was lunchtime. And the guys that worked in there were sitting against the wall on the ground eating their sandwiches and they looked like they were a mess. I think, you know, they probably washed their hands, hopefully, but that wasn't a good situation. When you go to the dump, where's the dump? It's outside of town. You go to Bend, it's outside of town. Because you know what, it stinks. If you go there to unload your truck and the wind's blowing the wrong way on a hot day in the summertime, it's rancid. That's why it's outside of town. So there's reasons why God has certain things in place for the millions that were in the desert dealing with life. And so all as they had to obey, not necessarily understand. The understanding could come later. It doesn't change any different in our life today. We obey things we don't necessarily understand, but the understanding comes later. When you've walked with the Lord and pretty soon a light turns on and you go, oh my goodness, that's why you pray. <laughs> that's why you read the word. That's why you stay in fellowship. You know, that's why you don't do certain things because sin brings death. And you know, even for the believer in this life, there are consequences for disobeying the Lord. And so in verse 4, it talks about swearing. I'm obviously going to pick up the pace. But, um, or if a person swears, speaking thoughtlessly with his lips, to do evil or to do good, whatever is, <clears throat> whatever it is that a man may pronounce by an oath, and he is unaware of it, when he realizes it, <clears throat> then he shall be guilty in any of these matters. And, you know, speaking is important. Uh, what we say is important. This is obviously speaking about broken promises. How important is it for us to keep promises, to be a faithful person in our words? This is speaking of oftentimes that foot and mouth disease that so many people suffer from. They say things, but they don't really mean them. They don't back them up with actions. The words are cheap. 
James says, 126, if anyone among you think he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So it doesn't matter what you say, it's useless. And he also says, chapter 3, verse 8, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So in other words, <coughs> it isn't the man that rules the tongue. It's the spirit in the man where the tongue can be brought into control to glorify God. And so broken promises, you know, I think of New Year's resolutions when people mean well, but they don't last but more, you know, by February, they're all broken promises. And so we have to be careful with the promises that we make. And do you know many promises are totally appropriate, like go entering into marriage, and you make a promise to that individual. That promise is not to be broken. When you're a parent and you make promises to children, do you realize they hang on every single word that you make as a parent? And it's hugely important, those promises. You know, there's a, a song that, uh, that I, I like a lot. And it's uh, one that Harry Chapman sings. It's Cats in the Cradle. And it's such a powerful song as far as broken promises that, uh, you know, I just want to read... I won't read all the chorus over and over again, but uh, it says, my child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away, and he was talking before I knew it, and he grew, he'd, and, and as he grew, he'd say, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. And the chorus, and cats in the cradle and the silver spoon, Little boy blue and the man in the moon. When are you coming home, Dad? I don't know when, but we'll get together then. You know we'll have a good time then. How many is familiar with this song? Yeah, a lot of you. My son turned 10 just the other day. Time flies. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me to throw? And I said, not today. I got a lot to do. And he said, that's okay. And he walked away, but his smile never dimmed. And he said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be like him. And then, of course, uh, the chorus again. And, you know, when are you coming home, Dad? I don't know when, but we'll get together then. You know we'll have a good time then. Well, he came from college just the other day. So much like a man, I just had to say, son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? And he shook his head. And he said with a smile, uh, what I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? And then the chorus again, but this time it says, when you coming home, son? I don't know when, but we'll get together then, Dad. You know, we'll have a good time then. I've long since retired and my son's moved away. I called him just the other day. And I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. And he said, I'd love to, Dad, but I... Uh, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle and the kids got the flu, but it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. I've been, it's been sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was just like me. And that's a powerful, powerful, uh, you know, uh, message. And it's a biblical message. And we see it here the importance of our promises, of the things that we say, mean everything. And so, you know, as we're held responsible for things that God gives us, hey, be a man of your word, follow through, do whatever it takes, <laughs> serve the Lord with a whole heart. Because I'll tell you what, what that message is going to be carried on by those that are watching, your children, parents. These next verses here, verses 5 through 13, I won't belabor them because it's basically detailing like the sin offering of chapter 4. And But I do want to mention a couple things. And verse 5, and it shall be when he is guilty in any of these matters that he shall confess 
that he that he has sinned in, in that thing, and he shall bring their, his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin, which he has committed a female from the flock, a lamb or a kid of the goats as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin. And so notice that it's vague what it is that he would be guilty of, but it, it's sin. And notice the main thing, it needs confession. What's interesting about that word there, confession, is it speaks of a confess, a word that speaks of thankfulness. So the person who's confessing is not because he's gotten caught, uh, what a bummer, I have to confess. No, this is somebody who agrees with God. That's what confession means, of that something is sin and is glad to the fact that he could confess it. And so... Verse 7, if he is not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord <coughs> for his trespass, which he has committed, two turtle doves or two young pigeons. There, you know, uh, was something that if you couldn't afford to come with a lamb, there's still opportunity to come with the turtle dove or the pigeon. And really, those two could even be trapped if you didn't have any and if they were available. But the lowliest, the poorest could have turtle doves or pigeons. And in verse 8, he shall bring them to the priest who shall offer them, which is for the sin offering first, wring off its head from its neck, but shall not divide it completely. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the side of the altar, and the rest of the blood shall be drained out of the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. He shall offer the second as a burnt sacrifice according to the prescribed manner. So the priest shall make atonement on his behalf for his sin, which he has committed, and it shall be forgiven him. And so that means pardoned. And so here uh, the idea was is that <laughs> there could be pardon and appropriation to be right with God. And, um, and then also the fact that the person bringing the turtle dove and the pigeon could be pardoned just like those who would bring a lamb or another sacrifice. The pardon was exactly the same. It wasn't based on the sacrifice, which all sacrifices represented the one sacrifice, which was the perfect and final sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's why if a man brought a lamb or a turtle dove, or we'll see here in a little bit, flower, it didn't matter. It was the representation of the one sacrifice because the requirement was met by Jesus Christ. And this is the symbolism there in that. And uh, more to say, but let me move on. Verse 11, but if he is not able to bring <laughs> two turtle doves, two young pigeons, then he who sins shall bring for his offering one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a sin offering. He shall put no oil on in it or uh, frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. He shall put no oil on it, or nor shall he put frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. Then he shall... I don't know why I read that twice. Then he shall bring it to the priest, and the priest shall take his, his handful of it as a memorial portion and burn it on the altar according to the offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sin offering. The priest shall make atonement for him for, this, uh, for his sin that he has committed in any of these matters, and it shall be forgiven him. The rest shall be the priest as a grain offering. So once again, providing for the priest... The priest shall make atonement for him. And, you know, today uh, the Jews believe that it's by their good works and their gifts that they bring is going to atone for their sins because they're not, they're not afforded a, a temple to sacrifice in right now. And so that's what they believe, that their righteousness could be attained that way. And some of the Orthodox Jews are so strict regarding these things it's crazy when i was over there in israel i remember at the king solomon hotel where we were staying that it was on a sabbath day and they had one of the whole, one of the elevators dedicated to the jew the jews celebrating the sabbath so a non-jew couldn't get on there because it was preset to the exact floor that all the jews were staying on so they could just walk in and stand there and get taken up so they wouldn't be doing a work on the day of the Sabbath, putting, pushing the button to the elevator. And so they, would, they could go and still do that. And they had all kinds of rules like that uh, that they would follow. These next verses, uh, you know, speak about <laughs> the, holy, the, the holy things 
Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, if a person commits a trespass and sins unintentionally in regard to the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring to the Lord as his trespass offering a ram without blemish from the flocks uh, with your value, valuation in shekels of silver according to the shekels of the sanctuary as a trespass offering. And he shall make restitution for the harm that he has done in regard to the holy thing and shall add one fifth and it shall uh, and, and, sh and it and give it to the priest. So the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him. And so uh, some unfaithful act, that's what trespass means, some treachery, something that, you know, uh, that he did against in either it's against God or man. This is against the holy things, those things that were set apart for the work of the Lord, and he would have to pay damages. The priest would set the price 20% more than what the damages were. The damages could even be unclean. If you weren't a Levite, you couldn't just waltz into the temple and do what you wanted to do. Uh, one commentator made a point that it was something to do with the embezzling of the holy things. Things were made out of gold. They might have been trying to chip away at some of this stuff. Who knows? It's not real specific but they had to pray restitution. And, uh, and so the priest shall make atonement for him. And then the last verse is, if a person sins and commits any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, notice it's not spelled out there. And I have to mention to you again, remember this, these five or offerings that are being taught to us right now are a framework that what else is being taught to the people will be built upon this framework that's in place that'll bring more clarity later uh, much like our penal code kind of developed and we have felonies of the first and second and third degree and misdemeanors of first and second and third degrees and infractions which pretty much just deals with fines and that book over the years as a country and our, you know, uh, society became thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker, and now shelves of laws exist so that we can maintain order. And so that every little facet of every little problem that somebody has now makes a new law to deal with it. No different. And this is, so this is the very basic framework. And <laughs> though he does not know it, yet he is guilty and shall bear his iniquity. And he shall bring it to the priest, verse 18, without blemish from the flock, without your, with your valuation as a trespass offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him regarding his ignorance in which he erred and did not know it, and it shall be forgiven him. It is a trespass offering. He has certainly trespassed against the Lord. So very specific against the Lord. <laughs> and... Um, and sins uh, of things that were known to be to be wrong, even if they were unaware of them being guilty of it, and that's the idea. And so the the priest shall add the one fifth on it, and it shall be given to the priest. And once again, it was uh, the practical element of all that was is that uh, you know God would provide for the priest. You know, uh, we've seen so far where the God was God was providing food uh, necessary for the priest, and now you know the the priest is going to be compensated that he could buy whatever else needed, I guess, for his household. Because the priest, the Levite, didn't go have a, a, a job where he was out planting fields and having flocks and doing whatever it was. His whole attention was given to the work in the temple, the tabernacle, and the sacrifices as a work unto the Lord and unto the people that provided a means for them to get things right between them and God. And so that was their whole purpose. It was never to be neglected. And that's how, you know, God would then provide for them. So some interesting stuff. We're out of time. Let's stand together. <laughs> So, Lord, uh, we thank you again for your word. We know how important all of it is and, and the foundation that it lays under us. Lord, that would help us to sort out things in life and to answer questions, to have truly the, the word as the sword of the spirit to do battle in this world around us. And, and the battle that we do, Lord, also brings deliverance to others. When we're able to answer a question, when we're able to have confident faith when we're able 
to have a testimony that declares your goodness and grace and then to be able to back it up with your word. We know that it would, it would bring people out of darkness and into your glorious light. And so I pray for our church, Lord, that we would begin to build that spiritual strength in our lives, that we can make a difference and that we can stand strong, that we can be an encouragement, that we can be prayer warriors, and that we wouldn't get off track for the things that you have for us. So I thank you for all those that are here, and I ask that you do a great work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you.